I'm Marina, I work at Monzo as a backend engineer. Um, and as a backend engineer in the payments team, I write Go every day to actually move money, which is scary. But prior to joining, I had absolutely zero experience with Go. And I was writing Ruby since about 2010, and mainly Ruby and Rails. Actually, are there any uh, active or recovering Ruby developers in the room? <laughs> perfect, perfect, lovely. Um, so before I joined and before I started writing Go every day, I was curious about w how it would be different from my day-to-day -day work and life in Ruby. Because, of course, you can read about the language, you can read about the features, but it doesn't really reflect on what writing code, like what is your day-to-day -day routine will be. And uh, a couple of weeks right after I started, when I started to get into, uh, into our platform, into how our code is organized, I um, want to, I, I tried to, I was, I was going through the code of the library GoCasa. Is anyone familiar with GoCasa? Okay, GoCasa is the high level Cassandra wrapper for Go. So it's a, a library talk to Cassandra database. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cassandra, this is the gist. Um, so yeah, I was going through the code, and what I tried, I was trying to figure out how to do a thing. I will get into it in a moment. Um, and what I expected to happen, what I expected to happen is I'm going to dig around for a couple of hours, uh, give up, and ask someone whether you can, can or cannot do it in GoCasa. But surprisingly, that's not what happened. What actually happened is within half an hour, I was able to find an answer to my question. And it got me thinking, it never happened to me with Ruby, especially with Active Record. I, <laughs> I've been using Active Record since, or Ruby, Rails Active Record since, again, Rails 2.1. And every time I tried to dig into it and try to understand something, I just failed. So, it got me thinking why, what is the reason, what makes Go um, code style, Go community, I don't know what it is, different, so it allows for this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna retrace my steps, I'm gonna walk you through what I was trying to find out and how I did it, and then I'm going to do the same with the Ruby library, and we're gonna compare. So this is the thing I was trying to find out how to do in GoCasa. And if you are familiar with Cassandra, I know you're not supposed to do that now. <laughs> I, won't, I didn't know that at the moment. But effectively, what the question was, how or whether can I select all the records from the time series table? It doesn't matter what time series table is, just a table. Um, and yeah, when I did find an answer, I was so impressed. I tweeted about it, and despite the fact that tweeting anything good about Go, at least at the time, was a social suicide. Um, so yeah, let's go through it. The first thing I did is, because I wanted to select everything from time series table, is search for readme for time series table. This is the section of the readme, and it shows already in the example there is a um, method list on the time series table. Sorry, is it too? It's probably too small. Doesn't matter. Um, that takes three arguments. Um, first two arguments are start time and end time. As the name suggests, time series table is a table organized by time. But that, it doesn't answer my question because I don't want to provide start time and end time. I want to do like just select all, right? So the next step was let's just go to the file time series table .go. You don't, I don't expect you to read this, don't worry. This is the whole file. It's about 70 lines long and it implements time series table. And if you look at the list of methods, what methods are there, it's pretty straightforward. The important ones are set, update, delete, read, list. That's it. So I narrowed down the search to two methods, read and list. And just even by looking at the signature, at what parameters it takes, read takes an ID, so it's probably not what I want, it read one record. And list takes start time, end time, and pointer where you will put the result. 
Um, now, unlike Ruby, just by looking again at the line 48, uh, the line where list is defined, I see that start time and end time have type time. Uh, so that means these arguments are required. I have to provide time. So the answer is no. I can't do, I can't select all of the records from time series table. Again, it took me, that was pretty quick. So let's do the same for the Ruby library. Um, I found something with a quick Google search. I have I've never used it. I have no idea what it is. But I searched for Cassandra, Ruby, wrapper, and that's what I found. Um, I, like, disclaimer, I understand it's not entirely fair to compare a database wrapper to an ORM, but the thing, I think, kind of feeds into the point because it's very hard to find the database wrapper in Ruby that won't be an ORM. So let's do the same. Going through README, no mentions of time series, but instead there is a model. And because, again, because of my experience with Active Record, because I've seen Active Record, I've seen this pattern, I know how it works, um, um, I was able to figure out like where to look next. But it might not be um, immediately obvious if you're new to the language like I was in Go. So here we have a model uh, that includes a module SQL record. For those of you who are not familiar with Ruby very much, in modules and including modules is basically a form of inheritance. It's basically the same thing as um, inheriting from a class. So let's look inside SQL record, because probably the methods are there. This is uh, the file SQL record. And these two long blocks, these are just imports. So it doesn't do anything. It just imports all of the other modules, classes, whatever it is, to provide uh, functionality. And, and some of them, so what you, again, what you would probably expect is on top, there is a list of required files. After the class definition, they will be included from this required files, right? It's not exactly what happens. It kind of works a little bit different. But again, seeing Active Record before and working with Ruby before, it's kind of, um, you can figure it out. Also, I cheated a little bit here because I removed all the comments from this code. This is actually a very, very well documented code. There are tons of comments, tons of examples. So this is, this is one, one of the great things about Ruby community. So digging further, um, I expected there's gonna be something, some method called all, well, that's how active record works, that's probably how this works. And I did find the definition of this method. <laughs> if, if you are new to Ruby, and if you haven't seen this type of things before, I imagine you would be very confused. But of course, Naturally, of course, somewhere will be, um, because it returns self, it returns an object, and I managed to find out that there is a redefining of a square bracket, so you can use these objects like this. So instead of calling methods, you, yeah, this happens. Which also answers the question, yes, you can do that. You can uh, the, uh, select star from a table by the means of this library. So the conclusion, from this is the code you write in Go will be much less abstract than the code you write in Ruby. And I put an asterisk next to abstract because it's a bit abstract to talk about this in abstract. Um, let's, let's run another experiment to define what I mean by less abstract. So, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna take two libraries that I found in Google um, on GitHub, one for Ruby and one for Go. I went for web crawlers, but why not? Or rather um, web HTML parsers, I think. Um, introduce a bug there and then run it, like run some example from README and compare stack traces. So these are two libraries I found. One is Wombat, it's a web crawler in Ruby, and another is Go query, same in Go. So let's start with the Go. 
This is the example from the README. I, if you see in the middle, I band link equals nil. It's not supposed to be nil, so this is, this is a bug. If we run this code, this is the stack trace. It's like six, seven lines long, fairly straightforward. Let's do the same with Ruby. This is the, again, example from the README. Turns out I didn't need to introduce the bug because it was already there. <laughs> but but web, pages, web pages change and uh, it's an open source project and it's very unfair to give, um, to talk about open source projects like this. So if we run it, this is the stack trace we get. And it's essentially uh, the same. So somewhere something is nil that is not supposed to be nil. It's a bit longer. And it's also not very um, representative of what you will encounter as a Ruby developer every day because um, I don't know anyone who writes Ruby without writing Rails. And if it was Rails, then it would be three times as long all the way down to framework stack. So I think the next question is why? Why um, Go is so much less abstract than Ruby? And I think I, I managed to come up with three things that I think influence that. The first one is age. So first of all, Go is a very new language. It's, uh, it's from 2006. Ruby was written in 1995. And with age, the community, with the age of the language, the community grows. When the community grows, open source projects grow and usages of them grow. And there's way more time. And uh, Ruby had a way longer runway of Basically, they had longer time to mess things up. Um, so if you run, uh, if you search on Stack Overflow questions tagged by Ruby and Golang, this is what comes up for Ruby. So it's 180,000 questions tagged Ruby, 270,000 tagged by Ruby on Rails. Uh, what's your, you can get, make a mental guess what's going to be for Go. It's much smaller. 20,000 Go, followed by Django, which has nothing to do with Go. Um, but yeah, that's the age, the, I wouldn't say the maturity, but at the size of the community that comes from the, from the age. The uh, next factor is syntax. So this whole section is just going to be about Ruby, because there is not much to say about Go syntax. And it's great. So what does Ruby have? Uh, you can omit parentheses in method definitions and colon methods. You have at least three ways of declaring an anonymous function. Uh, you can uh, you have an operator overload, like we've seen with the square brackets, and more. So why? And it makes the language incredibly expressive, but again, it comes with a price. So this is the code. And this is the typical code for Ruby. This is an excerpt from RSpec documentation. It's a testing, testing framework. So it's very expressive, very clear to read, and you can get into it straight away. But in fact, if you look close, what happens here is RSpec.describe, we call a method, we pass the first argument is a class, the second argument is a block, which is an anonymous function, and that happens um, it happens inside the block. So inside the block, there is a different scope and all the, all the magic of um, metaprogramming. In Ruby, you will, and this is the DSL, and this is what always happens, because Ruby is so great for writing DSLs. You will probably end up writing one if you didn't plan to, because it's so good for writing DSLs. Uh, there's another example, JBuilder, that's how you generate JSON from the Ruby code, which is also pretty neat. What does Go have? Go have Go format. That's it. Also, <laughs> also um, I think we have to remember that in 1995 was a different time. And at that time, when you wrote a language, you didn't release it with a bundle of all the um, plugins for all the call common text editors and the linter and the uh, import tool and um, and the style guide, which happened with Go. So again, the community had to figure out all the, thi all the things uh, on its own. Uh, and 
last but not least, type system. And I'm not talking about just like static dynamic type, and I'm talking about type system uh, in general, the difference between Ruby and Go. So Ruby is an incredibly object-oriented language. Everything is an object. Objects are objects, classes are objects, strings are objects, functions are objects. Um, and, uh, and this, again, this is great, this is great design, but it also comes, comes with a price. So the next experiment I ran, I uh, created a brand new Rails app uh, with one model, I mean, just generated, I haven't written a single line of code. And then I looked up uh, in Ruby REPL the ancestors of this model, which is like a built-in method to show all the objects in the class hierarchy, all the classes in class hierarchy for this object. And that's what I've got. So, and this again, this is just generated code. In Rails, I have, haven't written a single line of code. Uh, and you might say that this again is unfair because we're not talking about Ruby, we're talking about Rails, but this is the whole point. You can't talk about the language without talking about how people use the language. And the most popular project in the world probably, in the Ruby world, is Rails. That's, that's what took the language off. Uh, while in Go, what does Go have? Not much, doesn't have inheritance, doesn't have classes, doesn't have generics. Um, so yeah, that makes it much uh, simpler. As my friend put it very uh, nicely, in Go, it felt really nice writing this code, let's do it seven more times. <laughs> um, which means uh, we were talking about if you write, let's say, map function for integers, and you really like this map function, and you want to do the same for the array of strings, you have to go and write it for the array of strings because of the type and because of the typing. Um, so, in conclusion, what would you expect when you're switching from Ruby to Go? Expect that you'll be repeating yourself a lot. Expect that you will write a lot of boilerplate code, but also expect that you will understand what's going on and you will be able to read the code that has been written a long time ago but some, by someone who knows Go much better than you and someone who's much smarter than you. Thank you.